Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending March 5th, 2016. This first one's from sciencemag.org. Hold on a second. Let me turn down. I have a radio in the background there. Turn the volume down so it doesn't interrupt. Scientists gear up to drill into ground zero of the impact that killed the dinosaurs. This is going to be at the end of this month. Uh, this month, the drilling platform will rise in the Gulf of Mexico, but it won't be aiming for oil. Scientists will try to sink a diamond tip bit into the heart of Chicxulub Crater, the buried remnant of the asteroid impact 66 million years ago that killed off the dinosaurs, along with most life, other life on this planet. This is the first time they're going to get a chance to really drill into um, an undisturbed peak region and take core samples. And the reason why they're doing it out in the ocean rather than um, on land, there are parts of the crater peak zone that are on land, and they've even been drilled before, but not for scientific core samples. They've been drilled for oil exploration, but they said because of the conditions and the environmental studies, the roads that they would have to use to get into it, it would just be much easier for scientists to rig a drilling platform out in the middle of the ocean. And uh, so that's the way that they're doing it that way, and they're going to dig down 1,500 meters total. I guess at 800 meters, they hope to hit the peak of this uh, Chicxulub crater that way and uh, then drill beyond there and what they're going to do all along the way is they're going to test uh, not just the sedimentation but the different kinds of life forms and uh, small microscopic fossils and things like that along the way and see if they can learn a little bit more about what happened previous to the extinction event and uh, after the extinction event on top of those peaks but um, they said there's two other major craters that do have peak rings but the problem with them is they're so much older than the Chicxulub crater as far as impact craters go that they would not be able to that there's been so much erosion that the peaks are not really pristine as far as uh, being able to get information about the top part of the peak so the Chicxulub crater is the best chance of learning a little bit more about how impact craters work and how uh, they affect the life and the structures around them so if you get a chance to check that out sciencemag.org this next one's from abc.net.au MRI scans used to prove dogs can recognize emotional states in humans yeah I'm, I bet most of you pet owners will say yeah big whoop about that that they recognize emotional states of course they recognize emotional states in their owner but what this was actually looking for is to see if the brain activity when they recognized faces versus inanimate objects does it react in the same way does their brain the same exact region centers react as in human beings when we recognize a face and they did find that out too and one interesting thing they found out is dogs are actually better at recognizing subtle facial clues especially threat clues in human being faces better than human beings can recognize those so that's kind of interesting too um, he said one of the uh, researchers said dogs had evolved over tens of thousands of years to detect even the most nuanced changes to expression it's deeper than that like a dog can recognize threat in a person better than us when facial expressions are very subtle they're so subtle that we can't read them as well but a dog can recognize it and then they had a little joke at the end of the article here too I think it's more joke than serious although it would be cool if they could do this with cats but they said scientists are keen to try the same experiment on cats in hopes of setting the age-old debate of whether dogs or cats are better as pets but they do not like their chances of being able to scan a cat in an MRI machine what they had did with these dogs is since they had to be awake and alert they had to actually train these dogs to stay still for a period of time in this MRI machine while looking at these photographs yeah fat chance on trying to get a, a cat to do that you could probably get a, a Labrador or a Border Collie or a Shepherd or stuff like that give them enough training enough promise of treats and you could get them probably to lay still for quite long but yeah, good luck at trying to do that with a cat. And this is something kind of related to a Mythbusters episode I saw where they were, uh, they'd reconstructed uh, a replica of a grocery store to, to challenge the ideas of um, standing in different lines and which line moves faster. We've all experienced that before in life where you're in different lineups for different things, uh, grocery stores especially or big box stores, and you kind of look over at the other line that seems to be moving faster and you switch over to that line and it seems like as soon as you switch over to that line the one you used to be at uh, moves a little bit faster. Now these articles here, the first one from abcnews.go.com, doesn't really answer the question, and it's talk, this is talking about more um, lines in traffic. You've done that, too, where you've been in traffic, and it seems like there's four or five lanes of traffic, or even two or three, and the lane next to you is always moving faster, and then you switch over, and are you really making progress or not? Well, the ABC News story 
says really it doesn't make any progress at all and doesn't help out and it's not worth the risk of the danger of changing lanes and then the second article here is uh, about Henry Liu the guy that actually developed uh, smarter stoplights but he had an article that you're not going to be able to see online unfortunately if you get popular mechanics magazine like I do every month you'll see they did a little article in here too where the same guy Henry Liu actually talks about a study that he did on this and their basic study actually said and they talk about the Mythbusters examining this myth too and uh, this is they didn't do enough samples to really do anything but an anecdotal study in other words just not a lot of sampling but they claimed that they found that drivers that did seem to haphazardly switch lanes a lot sometimes gain between two and seventeen minutes of time now that's at a very a very big risk to others and a very big risk to causing traffic accidents and stuff like that or bumping into people on your blind spot but they claim that it does actually gain you a little bit of time especially if you're not very altruistic and you're very selfish so I've just wondered if any of you, I, I try to examine those kind of things too when I'm stuck in a line or stuck in a traffic jam. Being a, being a geek, I kind of want to know, is there some kind of an algorithm or some type of formula to where you could actually determine which most all of the time would really work? Or is it even that way? Is it such a random, uh, chaotic set of events with different lines moving in different ways? Uh, the one interesting thing at the end of the Mythbusters show with people waiting in grocery lines was when you... Uh, changed it from separate lines and people moving and, and waiting in different separate lines what you did was you actually had one main queue to where people were actually directed to the next open cashier from the main queue so everybody had to wait in line and take their turns one by one it actually took a significant amount of more time I think it was like one or two minutes extra waiting time because with your with your being in just one long snake the long line you had to actually you know move over and get into the next line for the cashier rather than standing in four or five lines for four or five cashiers but people were actually more satisfied with the waiting process and didn't feel as frustrated as when they waited in multiple lines so it may be that psychological thing when you have too many choices it frustrates you but when you think everything is really fair and delegated nobody can really cut in line or nobody can get out faster than you I mean how many times have you seen that too you get in a line and there's only one person ahead of you you see another line next to you with four people into it and boom 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 all four people are checked out and by the time you're looking over there trying to decide they're already gone you're still second in line to somebody slow ahead of you and then maybe four other people go over there and line up in that line again so no winning for losing I guess but that was kinda of my idea you know that you know maybe it's more psychologically about the way you feel about it more than anything else and this next one is from the Christian Science Monitor Scott Kelly's epic year in space is NASA any closer to Mars yet yeah, after spending a year in space well 340 days actually in space the longest of any um, uh, American astronaut Scott Kelly has come back and talked a little bit about it and I have a video right after it all as usual all the links to all these articles will be down below but right after it I will post the link um, to uh, the YouTube video sent to me by Navy Thomas, Tom, um, about the entire interview, his uh, press interview when he came back. It's about an hour long, but I'll just touch on a little bit of the article from uh, ChristianScienceMonitor.com. At the event in the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Mr. Kelly said that the extra six months he spent at, on the International Space Station, by the way, he He'd been there before. This was not his first time. Double the time that any other American has spent there has taken its toll. Over the course of his three missions to ISS, Kelly has spent a total of 520 days in space. He says, this is him in quotes, I thought it would probably be a little different, but it's more than just a little different, said Kelly. Coming back to gravity is harder than going to no gravity. The basic reason behind this experiment, and they're talking about before they attempt to go to Mars, maybe doing it with at least 10 other astronauts, maybe uh, female astronauts, older astronauts, younger astronauts, so they can get a feel just for what it would be like because a human mission to Mars may take several years and a lot of that is going to be spent on low and no gravity. So this idea is preparing and if, it, if they're going to need at least 10 more s test subjects, that's going to take if they do them one at a time and they do them on a regular basis we've got another 10 years of testing so that takes up to 2026 so I'm kinda of wondering too um, when are we gonna to get to Mars is it ending up going to be in my lifetime I mean maybe I've got another 20 maybe 30 years left um, to be able to see this so don't really know if I'm gonna see it in my lifetime or not but at least I'm glad to see they're making progress and we do have the Orion spacecraft which is actually made to go out into deep space and they're talking about other missions like going past the moon even possibly to um, have an astronaut actually come in contact with uh, a floating captured asteroid or something like that so they're definitely 
preparing for deep space events and they have the equipment to do it so um, who knows maybe if we uh, get a presidential candidate in there that will really promote, promote NASA and, and the outer space thing maybe we'll actually see and even some of us that are approaching 60 will actually see in our lifetime somebody land on Mars so anyway that's about it for this week take care everybody I will catch you next week